Welcome to The Lookout. The Lookout today is in Forbes Town, California. We're here with Jim Klump. Uh, I've known Jim for 25 years, I think. Yep. Um, worked together on fire and fuels and taught me some chainsaw safety 20 years ago. So uh, it's nice to be back here at Jim's place. Uh, this is a place, Jim, how long have you lived in this place? 40 years. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to come back here and see the fruit trees growing and like, oh my gosh, just how this place is changing. Yeah. I waited a long time for this. Yeah. So today I think um, Jim invited me to come up and talk um, about forestry and fuels management and all these things about fire that um, you know we're interested in and at the lookout, managing land, helping people. Um, live in a place safely and um, so I think you know one reason I was excited to come up here is because you've lived on this land for so long the same place and you've seen changes sure and that uh, you know, it's kind of an abstract thing for a lot of people to talk about climate change when they don't really belong in a place they don't sit in a place and watch it change and they don't grow fruit trees and they don't it seems to me like you're kind of intimately connected to this piece of dirt yeah so I, I was looking forward to coming up to talk to you about you know, changes you've seen here and yeah so um, where did you grow up and how did you get into fire I grew up in western Siskiyou County for I call Fort Jones my hometown uh, it was a mill town uh, lived in a logging camp for quite some time uh, the first <laughs> the first fire this this will blow you away but the first fire that i got paid on was uh the haystack fire in 1955 i was uh 12 years old and in the logging camp we lived in there was a kitchen for the woods crew and my mother and a couple other ladies were cooking for firefighters and the timekeeper, I'd been working in the kitchen for a, a week or so, and one day he went, hey, I don't see your time slip. And I go, I'm just helping. And he goes, you need to get paid for it. So he cut a fire time slip for me, and I got paid. I thought I was a millionaire. At the end of the fire, I think I made a $109 or something like that. And... Uh, so that was the first fire I ever worked to get paid on. Mm -hmm. But the Haystack Fire in 1955, September, uh, and it was, it was a barn burner. It was, it was about 100,000 acres. Wow. Burned from almost the Oregon border in the head of Beaver Creek off the Klamath to the outskirts of Wairika. So like when we had the beaver fire up there in 2014, was that burning the plantations that went in after that 55 fire? Yeah. Okay. Some of, some of them. So a lot of that was like 60 year old plantations. Yeah. Yeah. Poorly maintained. You know, we got to talking, uh, we, we've talked in the past about uh, fuels management. And when I was a division chief, I, I was responding to foresters' uh, prescriptions for logging. And I was seeing some things I wasn't comfortable with, um, of which one was even-aged monoculture. So I got a book called Smith's Book of Civiculture, which almost every forester in that period that had gone to forestry school in the late 50s, early 60s, that was uh, the first civic culture book they perused. And I read it and it made me realize we're making mistakes. And so I spent the rest of my career trying to undo those mistakes, but it fell on deaf ears, unfortunately that uh, we still are practicing 
uneven aged monoculture. Mm. We're not taking, even when we have these horrendous fires like uh, the North Complex and the Dixie, we, the industry and the government will go in and plant probably ponderosa pine trees on 10 by 10 or 10, 12 by 12 spacing, knowing that they've got to be or should be in there in a few years thinning and mitigating the fuel buildup. Doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. But the best example for people here in Northern California of even age monoculture, drive from Redding to Bernie, mm -hmm. Highway 299, uh, the fountain fire. Mm -hmm. The guy who did the civic culture work uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, doesn't mind, I'm sure he doesn't mind me criticizing him. But for the people who remember, that was a mixture of the big five conifers here in Northern California, sugar pine, ponderosa pine, white fir, dug fir, incense, cedar, interspersed with black oak. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. And corporate forestry, mow everything down, kill every bit of brush and turn it green with monoculture. Yeah, so were you around? Did you work on the fountain fire? Cal Fire had me come in toward the end and do some advisory work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alan Stovall mm -hmm. uh, was one of the operations section chief and Mike Shorrock, Mike's a uh, was at the, on the Butte Ranger unit mm -hmm. and said, hey, this is what we've done. W what do you think we should do? They had some islands. Mm -hmm. They said, should we burn them or line them? And I said, hey, you burned, you burned enough already. Right. Line, line those babies. Mm -hmm. and, and they held them and it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember that fire because it was the week that I moved to Chico right out of high school. Really? And, um, I remember driving down into Chester, down the grade on Highway 36, and the sun was going down through the smoke of the fountain fire. Yeah. Big red disc. Yeah. But I've watched that, you know, um, I've watched that as an example of like, hey, here's a place on the landscape that's aligned with low elevation coming into higher elevation, huge amount of sun, south aspect, up canyon winds, fun, you know, the wind gets funneled there by Lassen range, kind of go up over, you know, um, Hatchet Mountain. Yep. And it's like, well, if we had the conditions for the fountain fire to happen 1992, why would we think that's not going to happen again? And so every time we got a fire in Round Mountain or down there in the bottom of that grade on 299, I'm just like, is this the time we're going to take out all that work those foresters did? You know, 30 years of growing trees there. Yeah. You know, it's been 30 years, right? Yes. And the trees are still in this kind of period of, they'll always be in this extreme vulnerability to an event like that just because of the continuity. Yep. It's laid out. It, it's it's laid out to burn right. the entire uh, Sierra Range, mm -hmm. Southern Cascade Range. Uh, it's aligned with the prevailing winds. Uh, it'll well, happen. And, yeah, yeah. And I mean, if you look at the shape of the fountain fire, it's kind of like fire. Fire tells you where it's got alignment. You know, when you look at a fire history map, that's fire telling you hey, these are the places with potential for a watershed, a whole watershed to go. Sure. So when I see that fountain fire, I'm like, here's fire telling us directly that this is a place it likes to run. And then we yeah. go and we spend millions and millions of dollars to plant a whole bunch of little trees in that footprint. <laughs> you know, it's like, what are we thinking that's going to happen? You know, the same thing on the Ponderosa fire yep. uh, by Manton, where yeah. we burned 25,000 acres in an afternoon um, in kind of a lot of pre-commercial thinning slash in plantations. And then I think I feel like the forest industries, um, they're damned if they're, they do and damned if they don't. They have this land, they make money by managing it and they can't just let it sit there. So I feel like, I guess my worry with something like the Ponderosa fire is like, you plant this 25,000 acre block, 
And now you got to worry about it for 50 years until you cut it again. Sure. And so with climate change and everything else, like what are the odds that we'll get there, that we'll ever harvest you know, any of these plantations we're putting in? Like talking to Barry Kallenberger, who worked with you in the Forest Service, you know, he said, I can't think of a single place the Forest Service has planted a plantation where we've harvested it or where we likely will harvest it before it burns up in a fire. Yeah. Yeah, just north of us, uh, the former... I think it was Cal Box, Feather Falls, uh, had holdings out there and had done type conversion to take and put hardwood stands into conifer stands. And it's currently owned by Sierra Pacific Industries. And the North Complex, uh, it didn't even slow down. Those trees were very close. Some of them were being harvested, but plantation, there were plantations with uh, uh, 16, 18-inch uh, ponderosa pine in them, but uh, the bulk of it was lost. I don't know how they got it so wrong when you look at the decisions they made 30 years ago to start clear-cutting their entire ownership. Like, I don't know how they thought they'd get away with it without burning it up. I don't know, how did that, how did they come to that point? My experience in the Forest Service, fire's input to civic culture meant nothing. Mm -hmm. Meant nothing. Uh, I would sit in an environmental analysis meeting and say, we're were perpetuating or exacerbating the problem and the ranger would go okay moving right along and that would be the end of it mm -hmm. you know but uh yeah the, the the there's something there between foresters and and fire in general mm -hmm. there were some people who uh would listen but somehow the message never uh got through well, yeah, I think that that brings up, you know, there's this whole conversation to have around forestry. And I think a question I've got in this landscape of California is like, is it possible to practice forestry and call it sustainable without using fire? You know, I drove up here today and um, along the way, there's all these fuel breaks that have been done over the last 30 years on Forbes Town Road. There's one that looks beautiful, but there's a ton of surface fuel in there. There's so much surface fuel. And, you know, today, a little less wind today would be a perfect day to burn that beautiful and i feel like without that application of fire you know um on a dixie fire on a dixie fire burned everything i grew up in westwood so right. it's like if you take you know three of the four cardinal directions from where i grew up but burned in the last you know in this last fire yeah and all this stuff that we thought maybe was resilient like on collins land we had a lot of land that was opened up to like 50 percent canopy closure nice thin Young stands, generally, but like stuff that I would have looked at and thought it would survive. And they smoked, you know, 100,000 acres there in two days. Yeah. So I guess, uh, can we do forestry in dry forests without fire? I don't think so. We were talking earlier. The forest, natural forest, and we'll go back 10,000 years. It produces, it either rots, which produces methane, or it burns, which produces carbon dioxide, both harmful to various degrees to the environment, but you can't do nothing. And the agencies involved, if they think that what they did yesterday is going to work tomorrow, they've got a problem they have got to change. There are many things that the agencies have got to change in the way of thinking, leadership, equipment, um, general philosophy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I see between agencies, this division, this not talking, this um, uh, sweeping problems under the carpet, it's got to it's got to stop, and it, and it comes to a cease with strong leadership, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So how did we get it so wrong? You know, over, like, I was trying to think of a tactful way, you know, over the last month, thinking about talking to you, like, how, um, how did, how have we failed in, you know, in this, everything we've done over the last 60 years, um, putting out all the fires, not getting prescribed fire done at scale, like, why, why did it fall apart? Like, and do you regret, <laughs> you know, do you regret spending so much time putting out all these fires that might have prevented the bear fire from burning everything? Not really from the standpoint, I was the guy going, let's burn. And even though I did what they called fuels management burns, we'd burn anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 acres a year, mm -hmm. they were actually site prep. Mm -hmm. I was burning ground so that a civic culture could come back and create another problem. Uh -huh. When I would try to get the district ranger and the civic culture to go, let's talk about this, they'd go, don't have time. Mm -hmm. See, no, no. Where I saw, see, I started to work for the Forest Service in 1959, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. A bunch of things happened in the Forest Service. The people who were leading the Forest Service when I was young still had that Gifford Pinchot, for people who even know who Gifford Pinchot was, uh, he was part of American aristocracy, no two ways about it, a guy by the name of Teddy Roosevelt, American aristocracy. And this is the way it is, and we want you people doing these things. And they were very noble, good people. You know, um, uh, they went up against big business, Warehouser and those, who were raping the eastern, that was a bad term, eastern forest, going in and thrashing, leaving it, and moving west. And they could see that. They wanted to stop it. I gave them credit for that. But they created a group of people, uh, they were racist, sexist, homophobic, just like many Americans, and all of a sudden, social change came in. And social change that needed input from sociologists. What do you want this organization to look like if we change by bringing on women, minorities, uh, people of different sexual, uh, whatever. What does this organization want to look like? And these line officers said, oh, we need so many of this, so many of this, and so many of that. What we needed were people, good people, hard workers, people who knew the history and maintained the good but get rid of that negative stuff that permeated the Forest Service. We would talk about this social change that we were going through, and one of my guys one day said, well, it's kind of like getting George Wallace to integrate your schools. <laughs> know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they... they I were well-intending people, but they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to make this social change and maintain quality, quantity, esprit de corps, morale, those, those types of things. And that's essential for running a good organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's painful to watch the disintegration. Even in my career, in the last 20 years, of just the Fed fire program just collapsing under its own weight, where now no one wants to work for the Forest Service, and oh, they're yeah. going to work for PG&E. Anyone else that will pay more and give you benefits, and you don't have to be gone for you know a thousand hours overtime. Yeah, and get dignity, have dignity and respect. Yeah. So when you're talking about you know these technical solutions, um, I kind of feel like in a lot of ways that that, that ship sailed. You know that the Dixie Fire. Um, this fire in New Mexico, the Hermit's Peak, the Bear Fire, like they're beyond our ability in that we really need to admit that and move on, right? Like as long as we keep thinking like, hey, if we just had 10 more super tankers, if we only had 
40 more bulldozers in each county, we could somehow change the outcome of something like the Dixie Fire? So, like, what do you think about, I mean, are we at that point where we really have to say, like, look, we, some things like the Dixie Fire, we're not going to stop, no matter if we had everyone in the whole state working on it and every air tanker, like, it's spotting three miles. Like, we, we spent a lot of money on that fire on tactics that were sure to fail. Sure. And so how do we have that conversation? How do we, you know, communicate to the public that, hey, you can't expect us to put out the Dixie Fire. Like, we're going to try to save the towns and do what we can to, you know, reduce impacts. But we're not going to stop this thing until it rains. Right. See, you're onto something. And right now, sitting here, thinking to myself, in California, starting in the north, a little town called Hornbrook, Happy Camp, Weed, uh, Redding, Greenville, um, Paradise, Brush Creek, Berry Creek, and I'm sitting here going, we're next. I know, Jim. Like, I know. Like, I got a buddy who lives in Goasset who's, you know, fire veteran. Yeah. And he's lived up there. And when he first moved there, I, I just think, like, I got all these buddies who know all about fire who live in the worst places, you know. And Robin moved up there. And I was like, man, like, aren't you? How can you live here? Like, you look around. And he's like, well, I think my place is savable with effort. This yes. was 20 years ago, you know. Yeah. And now he's looking to move to town because yeah. he knows, you know. And I feel like every time I... I when I'm driving up here, I feel like I'm going to see like my old grandpa, not you, um, sure. the town. And then like, I don't know if well, next time I come back, he's going to be gone. Right. You know? Yeah. And um, it's hard to kind of turn off that wiring now. Every time I drive in a place like this, I'm like, fuck, this might be the last time I see this before it looks like, you know, Berry Creek. Well, see, one of the, one of the things that has to happen, and you're hitting on it here. People need to talk. People need to get some, hopefully, unbiased, non-political um, information. But if you look at the media, I'll give you a couple examples, what I see. With the Paradise Fire, th there were actions taken by individuals and saved their home. There, there was an old retire lot retired Alaska jumper who had done his hazard reduction and his house didn't burn. Gary Glotfelty, Gary's a retired Forest Service guy, didn't evacuate and he saved his and his neighbor's house. He had hose, had fire gear, had a hydrant wrench, saved his house and his neighbor's house and then the water went out. They, and here, when the, when the Bear Fire, the North Complex, came running down, um, not everybody in Forbes Town evacuated. And nobody talks about, what, why didn't you evacuate? Number one, I don't evacuate because I have my place defensible. I have neighbors whose places aren't defensible. But, but when everyone evacuated except a few, well, what did those few people who didn't evacuate, what did they do? What um, fed animals, watered gardens, um, watched out for other people's property? Some shaky people came in and they were told to get out. Um, but we, we have an unofficial um, structure in a community, mm -hmm. and the agencies need to report that. Mm -hmm. Another one, the, the, with the media, several, you get little bits and snippets of information from the media. Several years ago, um, local television station says there's 
there's some kind of a strange green algae bloom in Lake Oroville. And it's toxic. That was the end of it. Never heard another. I mean, you can take a, I'm pretty sure you can take a sample, take it in the lab and go, what is this? No one talks about the effects of the retardant dropped on this earth. Mm -hmm. Millions of tons for the last 50 years of diammonium phosphate. That ain't good stuff. And we have got to start looking. This is what I'm saying with equipment development and stuff. Mm -hmm. We got to stop looking at some of these things. Mm -hmm. These super tankers, the last day of the North Complex, Bear Fire, two V lats, a 747 DC 10, made three trips a piece from McClellan and dropped on a fire which had been stopped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we see just so much of that where the fire is clearly gone. It's just off to the races, right? And yeah, I, I, it, it pains me to see, you know, I've tried to not um, second guess too much. Like that's, a, I think, a fine line with my reporting is you know, not being there on the ground, sure. not knowing what the air attack was thinking. I, I like to give those guys the benefit of the doubt. Sure. But when I see a fire that's spotting two miles and we're still running tanker drops on a ridge that it's clearly gone, I'd, you got to wonder why why don't we stand those things down? And I think that there's this perception that it's easier to do that and waste the retardant than it is to explain to the public that um, we're outmatched. Yeah. You know, no one wants to have the public say, how come you weren't flying tankers the day that my, right. my house burned? Yeah. And so even on days that we know that it's marginal, it's like there's this feeling we have to do something. But I feel like we got to get past that feeling that we had to do something because like if having to do something means a Hail Mary burning operation that takes out 100,000 acres of timber, like there's these really real consequences to what was a political decision. Sure. Yeah. And, and something that the taxpaying public needs to be aware of, what is the cost? What is the cost of those bad decisions? Mm -hmm. And I see people making no decisions in other areas, make no decisions on aircraft use. After the Caldor fire well, last year, mm -hmm. I was talking to a former fire fighter, and, and I said, they're sure throwing the mud on that fire uh, within the Lake Tahoe Basin. And he said, well, if they think they've got water visibility problems now, wait a couple years. Yeah. So another topic. So I had a great talk with Sue Husari a couple years ago. Well, nice. last year. And um, nice lady. She's great. You know, we had a, we talked for four hours. Yeah. Uh, um, but one thing that came up there was like, um, you know, a lot of your um, contemporaries, but a lot of the people that you came up with and worked with or um, just kind of pointing the finger and saying like, if I was still in charge of this, like we wouldn't have the Dixie fire, wouldn't have the Calder fire. And um, it kind of kills me because it's like there's this kind of, um, well, it's this, this kind of state of denial, I think. Like sure. the people are kind of thinking that the conditions haven't changed. Yeah, they have changed. They have changed. And that's what I'm saying. The agencies need to change with them. Thought process, mm -hmm. strategic planning, mm -hmm. tactical application, equipment development. So what do you think like in Dixie and Bear Fire, like we've got now this, the whole Palumas basically has got this new, whole new look about it, right? <sighs> yeah. And what, and some places got a reset, right? Like Hartman Bar and sure. places where you've got the big timber got a nice underburn and we kind of are back on this natural fire interval. Like, how do you see us kind of triaging the landscape? Like, 
uh, in these large burned landscapes. My thought is get someone who's really good at civic culture. I think that I think you need a scientific approach. The Plumas had a man, Dick Casaldini, one of the better civic culture civic culturalist. He was the forest civic culturalist in Quincy. But but get back, take a look at what is plant su succession going to do? Uh, we know how plants uh, succeed one another, mm -hmm. and it's necessary. Um, certain uh, plants like Ceanothus energermis, uh, helping fix nitrogen, a bunch of s stuff like that. But we tend to, in the past, get in a hurry and within two years, practice that even age monoculture. Right, spray, those, spray the brush, plant a bunch of trees and bingo. walk away. Yeah. So you're saying basically like, hey, we, we have to recognize that this is gonna be a generational thing. We're not gonna have forests there for a long, long time. I, th I think, this is me, that it can be done, na you know, nature tends to do stuff in patchwork. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, replicate that or we had tan oak stands let's let them they'll, they'll come back f fast because the root sprouts I've, I've seen it time after time but let those root sprouts come up for five or six years then go in do site prep and instead of plant hundreds of acres of seedlings um, plant three acres 10 acres, mm -hmm. nine acres. Plant and natural openings and stuff yes. like that. Yes, but what we have, and what foresters have done, when you look at my property, I can show you where I've done fuel treatment, there's a draw uh, that deer have used. I noticed it when I first came in, bought the property 40 years ago. Deer use that draw. And so as I do fuel treatment, I leave cover in that draw so that, so that they can feel relaxed. However, uh, with the influx of mountain lions, that favors them also. But I'm still thinking about, uh, I'm still thinking about everything that is dependent on this piece of land. Mm -hmm. These dogwood trees, I counted one day, I sat there and there was a bunch of birds feeding on the seed pods six different species of birds are dependent on the dogwood for food mm -hmm. and people foresters landowners need to think about living in the forest not turning the forest into a parking lot mm -hmm. yeah i feel like the black oak zone you know when you think of all these places that people live in the sierra i mean there's a lot of black oak Yes. And that a lot of what we've called fuels reduction over the last 50 years, we, we could have called it oak restoration. You know, and if we manage the forest for the health of the oaks, we end up creating these fire resilient conditions yeah. and creating conditions that are easily managed with low severity fire. Yeah. You're onto something. And getting into the burning part of it, besides ponderosa pine, black oak is one of my favorite species for underburning. Mm -hmm. They they dry easily. They burn. Tan oak and madrone. They've got to be real dry before you can broadcast mm -hmm. burn them. But uh, when I burn, I get a hold of my neighbors and say, "Hey, I'm going to burn this, and I'm going to try to do it on a day that it's not going to impact you." And I think it's only the right thing to do but we have got to burn and not 10 15 acres at a whack we have got to start burning yeah well and i feel like with that in general um the message we have to get across to the public is that fire is not a precision tool and that our um current 
kind of comfort level with mortality is way too low. And that if, yeah. like, we've got all this ground that we'll never get to mechanically thinning on. And, but if I was going to go into your stand here with a feller buncher, I'd be looking to kill, like, 70% of the trees. Yes. Right? To make this yes. healthy. Yep. But if I run prescribed fire through here and kill 50% of the trees, people are like, oh, my God, it looks like shit. Like, you failed. I saw a bunch of red trees out there. Sure. It's like, well, that was the objective. Like, that is why we burn. <laughs> we want to kill trees. Or we've got right. too many trees here in the forest. Sure. But until we get people on board with that, um, it's just a tough sell that, like, you're going to kill half the forest. Um, well, see, we're... And that it'll be healthier after you kill half the trees. We're, we're killing a phenomenal... As you came up the hill today, notice the stands of, of Bonrose pine mm -hmm. killed by beetles. Yeah. Prescribed fire, uh, as indiscriminate it is, that when you allow a low intensity prescribed fire to go through a, a thicket, you've got a thicket of Ponderosa pine, and one day, I was standing, observing fire backing down the hill with my two battalion chiefs, and periodically a little tree would flare up. Uh, and we got to looking, and every time a tree would flare up, it was either a white fir or an incense cedar. Mm -hmm. And I went, check it out. This, this random act of fire is really discriminate. Yeah. It, it doesn't want shade tolerant species interspersed with, with ponderosa its, pine. With its good friend, the pine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting how pine has kind of set all those uh, other uh, co inhabitants up for problems with its long needles, you know, dropping its long needles oh, yeah. on things. <laughs> Creating a nice fuel bed. Oh, yeah. Pine really builds its own nest. Yeah, years ago when I was working for the Forest Service, uh, the division chief at Quincy, uh, Mike Doherty, Mike called me one day and said, hey, would you come over and take a look at a prescribed burn that I did this spring? I'm taking a lot of heat uh, from the timber guys because I've killed too many trees. And I went over and we drove around and I went, Mike, <laughs> civicultural practices prior to you doing this underburn set you up. Everything you've killed is a white fir. Mm -hmm. they, they took all the ponderosa pine, all they left you was the white fir. Right, and well, that's like, I talked to Jack Bean 20 years ago. I just found some notes talking to Jack Bean 20 years ago. And he said, Collins Pine, they're growing a lot of fur on the ground that should be growing pine. They won't be in business forever. And so when we have the Dixie Fire go through Collins fur, like all those trees were so much more susceptible to oh, yeah. torching and crowning. And yeah. I'd really like to see us getting fire into these areas. Like in the Dixie, we've got these islands that underburned. And in the next five to ten, it's like, man, we got to get fire into all these places. Yeah. And I, I get frustrated because I see the Forest Service is focused on roadside hazard reduction and salvage and replanting. And meanwhile, they neglect these patches, these opportunities. You know, so oh, if yeah. you look at, like, the moonlight burn, there's patches out there that underburned in 2007. Forest Service didn't do anything about it. And now they nuked off in the Dixie and they're gone. The patches that survived, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I feel like the whole landscape's looking like that. And like, if we can't get landscape scale burning done in a green patch surrounded by 50,000 acres of black with minimal risk of escape. Sure. We, we're never gonna get anywhere if we can't, like there's some really low hanging fruit out there. Yeah. You know, uh, leadership, you got to have st strong, effective leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got to get the private timberland burning again. You know, yeah. they're all afraid of. I mean, after the moonlight fire, they're all scared that they'll get a big fine if one of their burns escapes onto the fed land. But they're paralyzed. And I look at SPI, 
And I mean, they used to burn a lot. I mean, you used to sure. burn for them, I think, didn't you? With, did you ever, as a private um, burner, do any burning on SPI with Nortree or anything? No, uh, Louisiana Pacific mm-hmm. and Siller, uh, uh, excuse me, Soper Wheeler. Mm-hmm. We'd burn for Soper uh, and LP. But, uh, and you're right, this perceived risk, but it's also real. And who, when I was a division chief, we would run fire onto Soper Wheeler, did it a couple times, them onto us, and it was solved with a phone call. Hey, the winds came up last night and we got 20 acres of your stuff burn. Kill anything? And the reason that Paul Violet the head forester would say, did it kill anything? So he could get somebody out there to salvage it, mm-hmm. not take us to court. Mm-hmm. But, but working relationships, you know, and talking about working relationships, me being former Forest Service and those, those other guys, Cal Fire, the best person I ever worked with uh, on a fire, my my, as an operations section chief, my partner was a Cal Fire guy, John Hawkins. Mm-hmm. Good. His son flies air attack out of Chico. Yeah, John was one of the first people I talked to when I got into fire planning in Chico in 98. Yeah. Yeah, and then I worked on, um, we worked, did a lot of GIS for his team over the years. Good guy. Very passionate, um, a strong leader. Uh, but was a guy as a partner with he with Cal Fire, me with the Forest Service. We didn't we didn't really sit down and talk about well I know this you know that, but we evolved into those things that he was stronger with. I'd go, you know a hell of a lot more about this than I do. You take it, and the same thing in another part of the fire, another function. So where was he strong where you weren't? He was strong, he was strong in like interface, structure protection, interface, uh, talking to, he was a much more effective speaker than I. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was a person who, what I liked about him he and I could sit in a meeting and get some information from like a community or something and come out with different pieces of information. But what was cool with him, we could meld that information um, without egos coming into play. He, he was a person who never kowtowed, but he didn't have an ego that got in the way. And in fire, you see a lot of ego. You see, you gotta have a certain amount, but you know when, you need to know when to put it on the shelf. Yeah, I saw, um, there's a movie that came out, I, I did some um, talking in, uh, called Bring Your Own Brigade, about the campfire and about this fire in California. And they interviewed Hawkins. And he, um, they were talking about PTSD and um, and he was, I'd never seen him more raw and open, you know? And it was, it, I thought it was one of the more powerful scenes in the whole movie, was just him uh, not being afraid to talk about his trauma and um, his, what his guys have been through. Ooh. I think that's such a big part of where we're at right now. It's like all of us have been traumatized by the last five years. Either yes. our houses being threatened or going through the campfire. And I'm glad to see that's getting traction as a as an issue, you know. Whew. Really now, just because it's a matter of survival, right? Like these agencies yeah. realize that if they don't deal with it, they're not going to have people that can function. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We you know no two ways about it. Mental illness has, like in the last eight ten years, has been that ugly head has raised up. I think a lot of people are in denial. Uh, I have PTSD, started a long time ago. And 
what kept it under wraps was my job. Uh, being a helicopter superintendent, being a smoke jumper, being a division chief, um, going all the time, pumping uh, adrenaline, just going, yeah. And all of a sudden, a couple things happen all at the same time. Um, you retire, go through a divorce, and a child's killed. And took me out. Um, it was tough. But something I've always said, it's a condition, not an excuse. Mm. That doesn't give me an excuse to beat my wife or be mean to my child or scream, holler, or raise hell. Um, it's not an excuse. Get out of the bed in the morning, go, okay, here we go again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think part of that for me is um, that it feels like when we're lionized for being firefighters and being heroes, but we're putting out fires that we know are going to do good. You know, um, that there's this, this real kind of mind fuck there, you know, like, you you look at you know someone putting out a fire in april or in june in a place like the trinity alps or something where it's just sure. you go out there and it's like you can put it out with your boot because it's a good fire right you know and then you see the you know forest service pace on facebook like hey firefighters put out this you know two acre fire in the trinity alps and then you see all these comments like thank you you're heroes and it's like fuck this like this no. fire like no. how i i how can you feel good about putting it out and so there's this kind of I feel like that amplifies the trauma of a lot of what yes. we're going through. Yeah. It's like, you know, a lot of us don't feel like heroes for what we've done in suppression. True. You know? Yeah. And the public doesn't understand. And so they just like, I think it's just, it's really kind of fucked. Again, I think it, it's an education thing. Public quit treating military people, cops, firemen, First responders, whether it's an EMT, it's a job. I chose uh, the job I had. I chose, and like a smoke jumper, people go, oh, you're a hero. Not, it was not a hero's job. It was fun. And this is one of the things that today's young person has got to bring back into their life is having fun. Mm -hmm. Go play horseshoes, softball, drink beer, uh, sit around, just tell bullshit stories and make one another laugh. And that's what we had in my generation. Mm -hmm. Some of the shit we did it would blow you away. Well, and I think that's still this great part of wildland culture is the storytelling and the shenanigans. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, occasionally the work is heroic. So you save someone's life. You save their house. And, um, but the whole, um, there's this kind of tired trope in the media of, like, yeah. firefighters are always the heroes, the homeowners are always the victims, and fire is always the villain. You right. Know? you got that trifecta. It's like the perfect, like, the story writer is just like, ah, I got all three. Oh, yeah. Right? But it's like, well, sometimes we're not heroic. Sometimes we're doing the wrong thing. Sometimes we're putting out a fire that we know should let burn. Sometimes the homeowner isn't a victim because they built their fucking house in the middle of a big chemise patch, yeah. you know? Yeah. And oftentimes the fire, fire's indifferent, right? Sure. Like, it doesn't have an agenda. Yeah. So, a, kind of completely different topic, like, who's going to do all this work, right? Like, we got this enormous amount of work, and I think of, like, immigration, you know, and, like, the fact that a ton of people already doing most of the forestry work in this country come from Central America. Sure. And, um... I think about that with like Westwood and Greenville and all these towns that are pretty much dead for lack of industry and um, so many problems and so many people that don't want to work. And uh, yeah, like what if we just uh, open the border and let, you know, 100,000 people who want to work in the woods actually come and like move to Greenville and Westwood and Chester and these places that so desperately need a workforce of people that are willing to work hard. Yeah. Wow, so that's a good concept. Yeah, we uh, uh, 
we uh, hear at least on a weekly basis about those uh, people coming across the southern border and people's disdain for them. And my wife is Hispanic. And so we just, you know, she's, she's good at just rolling her eyes and going, whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but what we as a society need to do, and I think it's an education. Sometime I say, you know, I've been around the world quite a bit. And individually, Americans are some of the brightest, sharpest, innovative, hardworking people in the world. Collectively, we may be the most arrogant and ignorant people on the face of the earth. I, this is what I feel. What we need to do is really take a look and again, if it takes a sociologist, a team of sociologists working on this to say, here's how you get there from here. You're not going to do it by yourself. You need the community. You need the adjoining fire forces, agencies to get it done. Yeah, well, it's tough. I think, you know, part of it comes back to me, keeps coming back to these threads of like um, collapse and surrender. Right, like we've been fighting this war on fire, and fire, in my estimation, has clearly won. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it kind of, and it pains me to say that because I know, like, on the Hermit's Peak fire right now, like people are doing a ton of good firefighting, and they're holding a lot. They're saving people's homes, but if the wind blows for hard for the next couple of days, that fire is going to take off again, and it might sure. burn all the way to Taos. It might burn all the way to Angel Fire, and um, the longer we kind of put off this truce. I'm not saying that we just surrendered fire, but I'm saying that we negotiate a new agreement. Yeah. Right. That acknowledges its victory and that it and its superiority to our our wins, right? Yeah. See one of the thing again, I go back to leadership. Right now, on my road, PG and E has been in there for daily between here and the store spending millions it's got to be millions and what they're accomplishing is nothing they they they've got all these tree companies calling their own shots they're supervising themselves i see three chip vans come out Two of them park and do nothing, and the, the other one worked for an hour, two, three at the very most. Um, think of the fuels work you could do with that same energy. Right. That was same resources, that same energy. Well, and I think, yeah, we were talking <coughs> earlier about <coughs> doing work that's tactically useful, right? And sure. So to do clear a power line right away on a mid-slope, you know, I keep thinking PG&E, if they're spending um, $1.9 billion a year on veg management, pg and is, in California. And I had a lunch with one of their vice presidents last week. And he asked, what do you think we could do better? And I said, well, do regional scale fuel breaks. You know, do big prescribed burns. And then if you do start a fire, we'll pick it up at the ridge. But we're not going to pick it up on a mid-slope power line. Right, you know? yeah. And so I think part of that is that vision of like, you know, compartmentalizing the problem down like, oh, power lines start fires, therefore we must clear along power lines. And it's like, well, no. we have to be strategic and look at how fire is behaving and think, think big. Yeah. See, I keep going back here and I see the money there just on a mile and a half is what I'm watching. Mm. The last fire caused by a power line in this area 1991 and same day as the Oakland Hills fire picked up uh, no damage limited damage to anything 
And what I see being spent, if you did like you said, do it on a strategic level. I think the problem is, you know, and so everyone says, oh, well, it's all because environmental regulation. The only time you need to do CEQA is if you're asking the public to pay for it. Right. Right. If, if you want to go out here and cut brush, there's no environmental law to keep you from doing anything you want on your property short of selling timber. Right. Right. And so I think the problem with it is like the whole process, the whole CEQA and everything is it's because we're asking someone else to do the work. You know, people who live in a place aren't taking the responsibility. And I think you're, we're kind of socializing this cost. Right. Like you want to live here on your five acres and you've put in tens of thousands of hours of your own sweat equity towards yes. that. But people who move to a place like this, um, they don't realize that when you buy five acres that you're committing to spend $1,000 an acre every couple of years to keep it maintained. Yeah. And it's yeah. got to be penciled into people, you know, I think especially with like the COVID, you got all these people moving from the city out to the hills. And then they're like, oh my God, the fuels, this fire hazard, we got to get, the public needs to do something about it. And it's like, well, why, when I live in Chico, do I need to pay taxes sure. to cut someone's brush in Forbestown? Good point. You know? Good point. So uh, part of it's just that I think understanding that that's the cost if you don't want to burn up to living up here is you have to invest in that work. There's a lot to this. Mm -hmm. I think part of it, you know, I've been having fun. I've been doing burns with the Butte County Prescribed Burn Association. And that's been cool. Like We're not doing big projects. We're doing you know, five acres here, 10 acres there. But it's giving people time with fire in kind of sandbox you know i feel like we need people on board who can do the prep work to create a safe sandbox where people can come play with fire on their land yes because then they get to know it and they get to know like hey it's really easy for me to do a small burn around my chicken coop sure right it doesn't i don't have to you know i don't have to have four fire engines and a burn boss like i can burn some pine needles sure and the more we can kind of give people that exposure i think the better but like you said we have to really scale up yeah, you know, like a couple people here and there burning their lot isn't going to save Forbes Town. No, but I don't think anything's going to save Forbes Town, right? I just don't, I don't see it. I feel like the social problems we have, the poverty, the vegetation growth, the climate, yes. yeah, the structure of our timber industry. You know, like everything is set up for this place to go. The best to me, the best that could be done is to create some anchor points and from the strategic from the tactical part of fighting fire mm -hmm. you need strong anchor points mm -hmm. but you, you need to get a map take a get a half inch to a mile map and then work up to a a larger uh, scale and look at it and go, what do we need to do? But we have got to go direct at night and pick these things up. Mm -hmm. If not direct, fight fire at night where we've got good conditions, where we can do good burnouts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But toward the end of my career, speaking of burning out, I started paying attention that we on burnouts, <coughs> excuse me, on burnouts, we were uh, doing more harm than good. That we were burning out too far from the main fire, uh, not thinking of what was between our burnout and the main fire. All the deer, bear, everything down to rodents, whatever, we were burning up. Mm -hmm. And I, toward the end of my career, I started, uh, you know, paying attention. For instance, the fire is backing toward the road and it's up there a couple hundred yards. Why light from the road and nuke everything out when you can take a torch? And do a pattern. Here's a pattern we learned. Have you ever heard the term Biswell? Mm -hmm. And that's what we used to, uh, that's what we would use in prescribed burning. 
when we first started we would do strip fire and get unacceptable resource damage we were killing a lot more trees than we actually wanted mm -hmm. and a professor at cal a man by the name of harold biswell uh went to a class of his and he said you know we had a weekend class but i can show you this in about an hour and he got some some charts out and stuff like that basically what he said do a strip to get your buffer do strips till you have a buffer down uh, off your line and then go straight down the fall line either a slight ridge top or the fall line of the slope mm -hmm. and what he explained was when you do a strip fire you've got a straight line from here to here as you do these chevron he called them chevron patterns we began coined the term biswell then what you have in that same distance is an undulating line and you have half again and as much ground on fire with flanking fire not head fire mm -hmm. i've gone out and looked here on the plumas and they they forgot that they have either a bad prescription too many lighters or they're just using head fire mm -hmm. because when you go out to do a prescribed underburn if you create more fuel from your activity than was there before something's wrong wrong right yeah something ain't right didn't meet your objectives yeah yeah, yeah. i've been really enjoying burning um and I went out to Nebraska this year, and burned out there in the prairie. How was that? Oh, it's great. It was too windy. We only had two good burn days because it was like sustained 25 mile an hour winds. Wow. But we burned a couple hundred acres one day. Last year we burned 1,500 acres in one unit and then about 4,000 over the course of 10 days. Whoa. But that's, it's fun out there, you know, practicing those different patterns and well, I think, you know, burning in timber, too, you got that kind of residence time. You got to give it a little time to build. You don't, right. You, you, it's so easy to put down too much heat, and then you're just stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, what you and Barry did on the Bucks fire when you burned out from Four Trees Road to the north. Oh, yeah. That was um, a series of lightning fires. Um from Highway 70 uh, to the Oro Quincy Highway. One, one corner of it was basically Bucks Lake. The other corner uh, to the east was uh, Four Trees, and it came down Four Trees Road to Highway 70. And basically, the decision was made because it was, it was very rugged country. And there were, I think, four or five fires burning in there. And the situation was that uh, on a couple of these fires, you couldn't put people in between them because the other fire had threatened it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what we did, Barry and I came up with a plan to uh, hand light part of it but also helicopter uh, light the other part and the ha hand ignition mainly was nighttime uh, off the road uh, operation except for a piece of super wheeler um, land that we went in they had logged it we went in the night before and, and hand ignited so it could back through there and uh, we wouldn't suffer too much mortality mm -hmm. but there was they had to go in salvage some of it but what i did was uh, the helicopter ignition uh with one of those aerial ignition devices like ping pong balls but what we'd do is i'd wait until late in the afternoon and come down uh the ridges like similar to those biswells and put chevron pattern on this piece of ground 
uh, down the ridges and then just stop and let it back all night mm -hmm. and pick it up the next night. And I think we did that for four or five nights. We didn't hurry it. It was a north, basically north slope, mm -hmm. south of uh, the North Fork. Um, and it looks pretty good. There was a, we, we got a mosaic where we had uh, significant um, mortality was where they had helicopter logged some timber and there was no. On pg &E ground? Quite a bit. Yeah, that was like up above Grizzly Creek. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But uh, I think it turned out, I, walk, I look at every time I drive Highway 70, I look too. at it. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I started working with you guys not long after that. I started working with you guys in 2000. Yeah. That was 99. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and then now that's all burned again. So um, Dixie went through there, um, Campfire went through there. Yeah. I guess in some of those places where Dixie went through, it burned hot, and it kind of shows you that 20 years is too long to wait between entries. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. What do you think, like, um, is a good rule of thumb re-entry in some of these areas, like seven or eight years in an area that burns? Yeah, you know, it would be, it w there'd be a range, five to seven, I, and, and then... That next entry um, might be seven to nine or something, you know, something like that. You'd have to look at it and go, this is ready to burn again, mm -hmm. you know? The something here in California, the lower in elevation um, you're doing your prescribed burning, you can go out in the flats, out around, around Chico and burn a thousand acres really doesn't do all that good where the the best bang for the buck is above the transition fuels above the gray pine up through the ponderosa pine probably to four thousand feet something like that that's where you want to concentrate in my viewpoint mm -hmm. and south slopes i.e pine types and so the great spirit has the interpreter who says, be good, do good things, leave the planet better than you found it, etc., etc. And it came to me one time, uh, I get a straight shot. Sometimes I live up to it, sometimes I don't, you know? I was on the first crew, 1964, the first crew to repel and parachute out of a helicopter. I set the record for fire jumps in 1967 with 10. I think I'm the only jumper ever to suit up, load up in the plane, fly, jump a fire, and then fly the helicopter back to Reading. They were talking politics and I said, but aren't those the same politics that put Jesus Christ on the cross? Saw one of them a couple weeks later, and he said, you've got to conform. And I went, whoa. And he released me of this burden of being a Christian. <laughs>